Warm greetings from CNS. Welcome everyone to this very special webinar in the lead up to this year's World Asthma Day. Governments of more than 190 countries globally have committed to reduce premature deaths caused by non-communicable diseases, including asthma, by one-third by 2030 by adopting the Sustainable Development Goals at the UN General Assembly in September 2015. Today, we will learn more on how to accelerate progress to improve asthma management and care. Asthma care needs to be done in an integrated and sustained manner. The Global Alliance Against Chronic Respiratory Diseases, or GARD, is one such organization that contributes to WHO's global work to prevent and control chronic respiratory diseases like asthma. It is a voluntary alliance of national and international organizations, institutions, and agencies committed to the vision of a world where all people can breathe freely. CNS would also like to pay today a tribute to the memory of renowned Canadian HIV researcher, Dr. Mark Bainberg, who died recently due to an asthma attack. Dr. Bainberg was a leader in the fight against HIV AIDS and his researches helped people living with HIV lead a normal life. Yet, it was asthma that took his life away. Let his death be a grim reminder of the work that lies ahead of us to step up the fight against this illness. Before we begin the webinar, please allow me to make a few quick announcements. All participants are requested to please send us your questions while the panelists present. No need to wait till the end. Just type your questions in using the chat function or raise your virtual hand you will see on your screen. We will take up these questions during the question and answer session. I also request all panelists to please present in time so that there is good enough time left for questions and answers. Thanks for your cooperation. Without any further ado, let me welcome today's webinar moderator, Ashok Ramsuru, who is a senior and widely acclaimed award-winning journalist based in Durban, South Africa, with more than 43 years of rich experience in journalism. He was senior program producer at South African Broadcasting Corporation till May 2016. Over to you, Ashok. Is Ashok there? I think he's having some problems with his uh, internet connection. So we will, we will just give him a little more time if he can settle that up. I, I think he's having some problems. So I will chip in. Meanwhile, uh, I hope the problem is resolved at his end. I can see him on the screen, but uh... okay, as all of us know, asthma affects more than 300 million people worldwide. Although it cannot be cured, it can be treated and controlled. Good asthma control means no or very minimal symptoms and a low risk of asthma attacks or other poor outcomes. More importantly, good asthma control means a person can live life normally. Asthma deaths will increase in the next 10 years and the world will fail to meet asthma or NCD related targets of SDGs by 2030 if urgent action is not taken. We have with us today a luminary panel of experts who will share important insights on how to live normally with asthma, manage asthma well, reduce risk factors and triggers and also focus on linkages of asthma with risk factors like tobacco use. Without any further ado, let me introduce the panelists for today's webinar. Dr. Kevin Mortimer, Department of Respiratory Medicine, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, UK, and honorary lecturer at the Malawi College of Medicine. Professor Surikant, Head of Respiratory Medicine Department, King George Medical University, KGMU, and National President of 
Indian Chess Society. Then, Chakatip Kiat Duriya Kul from Northern Thailand who has been living with asthma since her childhood. People always come first. So let us begin with the community voice of Chakatip Kiat Duriya Kul. She has been living with and managing her asthma well since childhood and has shared her experience via email due to her inability to be present here today. Here is what Chakatip, a finance expert from North Thailand, has to say about her personal experience of living normally with asthma. I am just quoting from what she has sent us via email. I had asthma since very young, when I was around 6 years old, until around 20 years old. After that, I had asthma only periodically. In some years, I was totally fine and almost forgot about this until 2007 when there were a lot of smokes in Chiang Mai. I started to develop the symptoms again. The longest period was about six months after I lost my job at HDN. It came back and I guess because of stress, I had it longer than usual. So almost half a year that I had to take medication and could not work hard. The conditions that I had to watch out are dust, smokes, heat, overexercise, and stress. When the symptoms start, it is best to take medication right away. Otherwise, it can get worse quickly. The medication for me is free since I have social security. I think it is important to have medication available all the time. Do not wait until the symptoms get stronger. In my case, there was a time when I was in high school and I had to be admitted to hospital because I did not have medication for over an hour. I should have informed my teacher or school's nurse, but I did not. I think regular physical exercise does help a lot. When I started to work out, I had to be very careful because I cannot be too exhausted. So I started with easy workout, like walking on treadmill for 40 minutes and increased the intensity little by little until I could do hard exercise. Other than physical exercise, I use medication, meditation and music to help reducing symptoms. There was one time when I had asthma during the night time and was unable to get the medicine. Luckily, it was not a severe one, only some small wheezing. So I tried to control my breath and listen to music until I was asleep and it did work fine. Sometimes drinking strong coffee has helped me too. At first I did not know about it, but after I was told and tried it myself, I found it quite useful, but it works only with mild symptoms. I think creating and living in a good clean environment would help too. So I do not have too many things in my house. Too, man, too much stuff will collect dust, especially books. So I either throw away or donate unused stuff regularly. Having lots of free space is good for the mind as controlling stress is another key part of keeping asthma away. That was Chakatip from Northern Thailand bringing the community voice right up front as we now go on to our first specialist. Let us now listen to Dr. Kevin Mortimer, Department of Respiratory Medicine, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, UK, and honorary lecturer at the Malawi College of Medicine. Over to you, Dr. Kevin. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. But do yes. You? Yes, yes. Uh, so, um, I'm a, a reader in respiratory medicine at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine. I work clinically at one of our local hospitals where I do asthma clinics. 
but most of my work, research particularly, has been in Africa. For this uh, talk, I'd like to just go through with you um, these five topics. In such a short talk, I can't go into any depth uh, with any of these, but I've tried to pick out some points that I think are particularly important. Um, so I'll start with what is asthma and look at this from various directions, then refer to the um, asthma and the sustainable development goals. Think about how big the problem of asthma is, touch upon the treatments, and then end with a call for action for people with asthma living in poverty around the world. So what is asthma? Asthma is a neglected tropical disease. I say this slightly tongue in cheek, uh, with the neglected tropical diseases being a group of uh, conditions seen in the tropics that had been neglected for many years. But in this new era, asthma and other non-communicable respiratory diseases and non-communicable diseases in general are arguably now the more neglected or perhaps the most neglected of the diseases affecting people in lower middle income countries. So asthma is also a disease of poverty. Perhaps more accurately, poor control of asthma, poor access to asthma treatments, a high risk of financial impacts of having asthma, a high risk of dying from asthma are associated with poverty. So asthma is one of the commonest non-communicable diseases and amongst the respiratory diseases, which are in the top four groups of common non-communicable diseases, it is the commonest non-communicable respiratory disease. Strangely, for a, common, a, a condition that is so common, uh, we don't have a good, well, we don't have a diagnostic test, a definitive diagnostic test. We have got definitions, but there isn't a gold standard definition. And ultimately, it comes down to a clinical diagnosis made by a clinician who can identify asthma when they see it. This is the definition from the Global Initiative for Asthma, GINA. Asthma is a heterogeneous disease, usually characterized by chronic airway inflammation. It's defined by the history of respiratory symptoms such as wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness and cough that vary over time and in intensity, together with variable expiratory airflow limitation. We don't have time to go into this in, in any detail, but you can see there's, there's complexity there um, behind a condition that is actually uh, very common, and most of us can recognize it when we see it. So where does asthma fit within the sustainable development goals? Well, mainly within goal three, good health and well-being. Um, and there's an important target within goal three, which is to achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection, access to quality essential healthcare services and access to safe, effective, quality and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all. There's also a target to reduce by one third premature mortality from non-communicable diseases. So asthma sits very firmly within the sustainable development goals and must be addressed to deliver on these. How big a problem is it though? Well, a huge one. Asthma affects over 300 million people around the world. That's about one in 20 people. And a considerable number, some quarter of a million people die from asthma every year, arguably avoidably. The good news, as we've um, heard from our patient, uh, with effective treatment, people can lead normal lives. But there are two groups of patients that stand out as being underserved. Firstly, there are those people who, despite everything money can buy, and this therefore largely means people living in high-income countries, have asthma that cannot be controlled. But the biggest part of the iceberg is the many, many people around the world who lack access to basic effective treatments. What are these treatments? Well, broadly, they're inhaled treatments and they're, as required, reliever treatments. So when a patient gets wheezing, tightness, um, coughing, breathlessness, they can take these reliever treatments 
and those symptoms will resolve. And there's regular preventer treatments that stop those symptoms arising in the first place. And of those regular preventer treatments, inhaled steroids are the most important. They're on the WHO essential medicines list, yet they remain out of reach for many of the world's poor who have asthma. This is a travesty because these basic effective treatments prevent asthma deaths. The way to use these treatments is in a stepwise way, such as this uh, illustration of the union stepwise approach to asthma treatment, whereby as asthma severity increases, so does the dose of inhaled steroid for preventing asthma symptoms. This is a picture from the Global Asthma Report 2014, and it gives an indication of the availability of inhalers in various countries around the world. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see a list of countries. Um, and at the top, you've got three inhalers, bectomethasone, salbutamol, and budesonide. The red indicates poor availability. Or talking in the background, it's not coming from me, by the way. Um, uh, and the, the green... <laughs> very poor availability. <laughs> so what about the cost of these inhalers? Well, this is a nice um, picture also from the Global uh, Asthma Report showing that, for example, in Malawi, to afford a single be beclomethasone inhaler, someone would have to work, the average person would have to work eight days to afford that. So if you've got a child with asthma, you're talking about spending a week simply to afford an inhaler for them. So turning to the uh, last uh, slide, um, bearing in mind it's a short talk and I've only been able to pick on some, some of the things that I felt were particularly important to say. I think the most important thing to say is that asthma is a major global health problem. Millions of people are affected around the world. And the greatest burden of this, the greatest burden of suffering and death, falls upon the world's poor. And this has to change. Thank you, Dr. Kevin, for uh, a short but sweet presentation. And uh, we are now just waiting uh, for uh, Professor Dr. Surikant, coming from India, a country with enormous burden of chronic respiratory diseases, to join us online. He had been busy in a meeting with the governor, so he's just coming quickly back to this webinar. He has been on the CNS webinar panel of experts several times. Welcome back, Professor Surikant. We'll just give him two, uh, I think we'll give him a few minutes to join. Meanwhile, I have been receiving many comments and questions from the participants. And uh, one of the comments is from uh, Luke Bisani, senior reporter from Malawi 24 Media Malawi. Uh, and Luke says there is a need to cover more on asthma in Malawi, especially in rural areas of the country. And there is a similar comment from Vishpati Verma of Swaraj Welfare Society India. And Vishwati says there is a sort of scare around asthma in rural areas where people feel that people with, with asthma cannot lead a normal life. So there is need to have discussions and to create a lot more awareness around this disease and also to make treatment accessible and available to people living in rural and hard to reach areas. Uh, I think we have Professor Surikant is almost about to come, but Kevin, would you like to say something on these uh, comments regarding the lack of information around uh, asthma? I couldn't agree more, and both of those um, comments um, relate to uh, people who are uh, in relatively poor conditions, uh, the rural poor, and I think that speaks nicely to the point I was making about asthma, and particularly poor control of asthma, poor access to treatment, is particularly a problem of poverty. And I completely agree that people in those conditions need better access to the basic effective uh, care and 
the uh, the com alongside that, the communities and people affected need to know more about asthma and how to access that that basic effective care. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, Aking Otinio, communications and digital advocate from Kenya Tobacco Control Alliance. Uh, he would like to ask a question. So, Otinio, would you like to ask your question now? Otino, would you like to ask your question? He has sent his question. He wants to know if there are evidences that uh, and linkages between tobacco, smoke, and asthma. In short, yes. The um, amongst the many uh, amongst the many causes of asthma, exposure to smoke and particularly tobacco smoke is very high up there and it's a completely avoidable exposure. Um, it's now very well known that active tobacco smoking and passive tobacco smoking are both strongly associated with the development of asthma, the progression of asthma and exposure to tobacco smoke and particularly active tobacco smoking affects how well the inhaled treatments work, in particular the inhaled corticosteroids work much, much less well in people who are current smokers. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's another question and I think related to one of the comments which I had read out earlier. How can we improve access to basic, basic effective treatments, especially in rural Kenya? So basically it is more about the rural part of different countries where asthma is prevalent. Yes, so this comes down to health systems strengthening more broadly um, and it's not perhaps a completely specific problem to asthma, it's a problem for the other non-communicable diseases and arguably the communicable uh, diseases as well. Some of the latter are relatively well served by vertical programs such as TB programs, um, the acute treatment of uh, malaria, HIV um, programs. Um, but beyond um, some of those disease specific areas, many of the rural poor are not served at all or are served very poorly by health services generally. So in order to achieve effective asthma care for all, um, and particularly the rural poor, health systems in their broadest sense need to be strengthened uh, and, and a key part of that strengthening needs to be access to funded basic effective treatment. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would request the participants to please keep on sending your questions either using the chat function or ask the question yourself raising the virtual hand which you would be seeing on your screen. Uh, meanwhile we have a question from Modupe Adulojo, editor and senior correspondent, Federal Radio Corporation of Nigeria. Uh, he wants to know what efforts have been made to reduce asthma attacks in children. And is there a link between asthma and lung cancer? Kevin, again, we are looking up to you. Great. Uh, let me uh, answer the last one uh, first. There's no association between asthma and lung cancer. Um, but um, the issue of uh, asthma attacks in children is a, is a crucial one um, because asthma attacks, um, firstly, they're unpleasant for the patient, they're frightening, um, but they're also associated with other problems such as uh, affecting school attendance, um, affecting the ability to go out and play and be a child. Um, they're also associated with uh, the, a higher risk of uh, death. After all, each asthma attack or exacerbation reflects things getting severely out of control. Um, what can be done about this um, largely uh, comes back to the provision of basic effective care and, and what's 
um, really most important amongst basic effective care is securing the availability of the preventer treatments because arguably the great majority of asthma exacerbations can be uh, prevented if basic effective preventer treatments are available and importantly are taken and are taken correctly. Um, so I think we know what needs to be done. Um, we know that uh, children who have a diagnosis of asthma or children who have symptoms suggestive of asthma need to be properly evaluated uh, to get to the point of having a diagnosis. And then they need to uh, be started on ba these basic effective uh, treatments. And then once that base is covered, um, there are various other aspects of care that are important, including education um, and including the provision of management plans that mean that patients, uh, children with asthma and their carers can take action themselves to avoid things escalating as their asthma control starts to deteriorate and thereby prevent exacerbations and hospitalizations. Uh, thank you. And many uh, journalists want to know, including uh, Modupe, what, can, what role can the media play to mobilize more support on asthma control from governments and, and also from the community? Uh, so, um, uh, taking an interest like those on this webinar have done is, a, um, is essential. And um, events like World Asthma Day are, are very, uh, it's very important that they're covered uh, to raise general awareness. So I think um, media certainly has a, a role, um, an important role to play in uh, getting these messages out. And um, if, if um, you know, look, looking at uh, the Global Asthma Network, looking at uh, the Global Initiative for Asthma, looking at the Sustainable Development Goals, all of these have clearly stated within them uh, uh, what needs to be done uh, globally and, and what, uh, uh, what efforts need to be harnessed uh, through uh, politicians, for example, through uh, non-governmental organisations. Um, and so I think an advocacy uh, approach, uh, whilst uh, an advocacy whilst sharing the facts and figures that we uh, now know well, uh, would be very important things media could do. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. I would request the participants to please uh, keep on sending your questions either using the ch uh, chat function or uh, asking the question yourself by raising the virtual hand which you see on the webinar screen. Uh, we are uh, still waiting for uh, Dr. Ram uh, uh, Surekant to please to be there to join. I think he's having some problems again with his internet connection. So meanwhile we continue with the question and answer session. We still have many questions which have already reached us. Uh, Madhu Babu, a reporter from Andhra Jyoti Telugu daily newspaper from India, wants to know how much does air pollution contribute to asthma? Is it a cause? Uh, this is an excellent uh, uh, question and had I known I'd have um, more time I could have prepared some slides on this as well but absolutely yes. Air pollution uh, and I would take air pollution in its broadest sense. So that's yes. the out outdoor air pollution, indoor air pollution, occupational exposure to air pollution, tobacco smoke related air pollution are all major issues here. They are all uh, uh, firstly very, very unhealthy exposures in their own right. And then in terms of asthma specifically, associated with the development of asthma, progression of asthma, asthma exacerbations, asthma deaths. So all of these uh, um, forms of air pollution are absolutely major uh, problems um, and extremely important that uh, uh, they are addressed. I've got a particular interest in household air pollution, which is um, a particular interest because 
it's also a problem particularly of the world's poor. So this is air pollution that's caused by the burning of dirty burning fuels like wood, crop residues, charcoal in open fires and it's the burning of kerosene fuels in, in lamps. And these, are, these fuels are used in the indoor environment in homes right across the world. You know, almost half the world's population are using these fuels on a day-to-day -day basis for their basic energy needs for cooking, heating and lighting. And these exposures are extremely high um, and are associated with a wide range of um, health problems, um, including a, a large uh, proportion of non-communicable disease, chronic respiratory disease and chronic cardiovascular disease. So yes, absolutely, air pollution is a, is a, a top uh, problem uh, and a, a top, a, at the top of the things that are avoidable and need to be addressed. Uh, what can we, as a community, do to overcome this problem, uh, Kevin? Like, yes, there are a lot of uh, uh, steps which need to be taken at government and higher levels, but uh, as a community, what can we? Ap apart from controlling indoor air pollution, perhaps that is a lot more in our hands. Yes, well, what's, what's in our hands? I guess for each individual, we could look at in what way are we contributing uh, to the problem currently uh, and how might we change that uh, behavior. Um, so I guess the most obvious one to pick out is smoking um, and so anyone anywhere around the world who is smoking is contributing to the problem either to their own health or adversely to the health of others or adversely in an indirect way uh, by the effects on the environment of uh, the tobacco industry. So I think I have to pick on tobacco smoking first of all. Mm. Um, then if we were to think about um, uh, w what perhaps comes next down in the, um, is, is actually the household air pollution. Um, and there it's much more difficult because whilst to some extent, uh, uh, there's individual control over tobacco smoking. When it comes to the exposure to household air pollution, um, here people are much more constrained uh, in that it's a problem of poverty. There's a problem of choice Pe because uh, people who are so desperately poor that they can only use and access the dirtiest burning fuels actually have little choice uh, in the matter. But then turning to those of us who are living in living somewhat more privileged lives, driving motor vehicles. Well, um, motor vehicle uh, emissions are an important source of outdoor air pollution. Um, and people like me who drive a diesel car into the city um, could perhaps think again about the, my choice of transport and my choice of fuel. Yes. Right, very rightly so. Uh, we have a, a very interesting question from Reverend Nicholas Busani Bengu of RECT, Religious Communities Ending TB from South Africa. Uh, he wants to know if it has been considered that religious communities can also be utilized as a vital and critical wing in the fight against asthma. Because most of the, mostly, most, a lot of the affected communities are their members. I think uh, the community, uh, wh wherever um, there are organized communities, and the religious communities is a very good example, um, there's, there's an opportunity to harness uh, individuals, populations, um, behind efforts to address problems. And perhaps um, those exposures um, that we were just talking about would be an example where um, communities coming together might be able to address issues that are affecting their individual households, their um, villages, their towns, their cities, their congregations. Um, and perhaps by rallying uh, support for those living in the most vulnerable conditions, which many religious communities have a very strong track record in 
doing, that is standing up for those who have not and those are, who are most vulnerable. Um, and that's what we're talking about uh, in terms of the world's poor not having access to basic effective treatments. Um, that, that's a group of people who are in desperate need of advocates um, uh, and therein may lie one way at least in which religious communities could assist. Thank you. Uh, we have an important comment from Yusuf Muhammad, Professor of Pulmonary Medicine, uh, a Syrian private university from Lebanon. Uh, he says Syria is not included in asthma control drives. We have asthma patients here too. Sorry, could you repeat that one? He says Syria is not included in this asthma control drive. We have asthma patients here too what needs to be done more to increase awareness in Syria. He's particularly talking of his own country and yeah. a diff difficult country right now. No, I, um, I think that uh, here, um, perhaps especially so for uh, Syria, mm -hmm. where, um, there's this uh, broader problem of health systems that need strengthening um, and uh, the fir I think the first thing that needs to be done in terms of health system strengthening is to stop destroying them mm. um, and I, I think many of us around the world who watch the news and see what is happening to people in many uh, vulnerable parts of the world um, you know and Syria is a very good example um, but be dismayed by the degree of destruction. Uh, uh, how on earth can we start uh, uh, strengthening health systems when they are being actively destroyed? Um, so I think um, step one has to be, it's easy to say, um, stop destroying the health systems. And then really the, um, the principles um, remain the same wherever people are, um, in any country of the world, there are some basic essential needs. Um, there are some basic human rights out there. Um, and uh, although this is a session particularly about, about asthma, um, more broadly, there's a need for um, basic effective healthcare, universal access to uh, healthcare for everyone, wherever you are. Okay, thank you. Uh... I would request the participants to please keep sending your questions. If any one of you wants to ask the question yourself, please, please raise your virtual hand and you can ask personally the question. I'm receiving the questions, so I'm asking them. So any one of the participants, please ask questions if you want to. Meanwhile, I think we have Dr. Surikan who's just settling in with his uh, microphone. And uh, so shortly he will be there on the panel. And again, a request to the participants to please send questions through chat function or ask them yourselves. We had one question from India, Pooja Pingle, a banker from India. She wants to know how to control asthmatic attacks in changing weather. And is there any particular diet to be followed by the patient? Some things to be avoided and not taken. Kevin, what do you have to say to that? So how to avoid how, any particular diet to be followed and uh, to avoid certain uh, things to eat or not to eat? Well, as far as diet's concerned, there are some individuals who have sensitivity to um, uh, dietary components um, and some people who will um, be allergic to certain dietary components. But that's actually in the minority of patients with, with asthma. Mm -hmm. And actually what's most helpful, what's most useful, is to have a balanced and healthy diet. Um, and to, uh, alongside other healthy lifestyle uh, activities, such as physical exercise and keeping fit. Um, so looking after one's general health um, is an important component of staying fit and well with asthma. Uh, does, does fast food have anything to do with it? 
sometimes I hear people saying that uh, fast food is also something which, of course, it's not good in any way, but uh, does it have some direct connection with asthma? Um, it's not. So it's not something that I know a lot about, to be honest, but I would say, um, as you've just said, that um, fast food isn't healthy generally uh, in, uh, in any case. So it's one of those things that whilst once in a while perhaps is fine, generally best uh, okay. to stick to a broadly healthy diet. Okay. And what about changing weather? Because uh, Pooja also wants to know, and I've also heard people saying that when the weather changes, Sometimes they say we can predict a change in the weather because I'm getting an asthma attack or something like that. So um, and this is this is very true, and this is very much uh, uh, a tri uh, um, something that that happens. And um, weather changes are commonly reported by patients as uh, triggers. Um, and there are certain phenomena like um, uh, thunderstorms, where after a thunderstorm. Uh, uh, hospitals can sometimes see a surge in patients with uh, asthma exacerbations. Um, so it's a very real phenomenon. Um, here, what, so what should be done about this? Well, firstly, um, people who, are, who um, are finding that these often non-specific uh, uh, exposures are, tr are trigger triggering them, uh, it's worth having a review of the maintenance asthma treatment to make sure that this is optimized um, and then as part of that it's good practice to have a personal action plan uh, developed um, which then will take the patient through what ought to be done as symptoms start increasing as peak flow starts to change and this is something that needs to be individually ta uh, individually tailored um, by a healthcare professional working with the uh, patient Okay, thank you. Uh, we have, uh, I see Dr. Surikant there on the line. Uh, Dr. Surikant, can you hear me? We are waiting to hear from you. I think he's uh, still having some problems with his connection. Although I can see him online. Yes, Dr. Surikant? Maybe we give him a little more time to settle. We have a question from a journalist from Philippines about uh, the use of uh, alternative medicine for uh, treatment of asthma. Kevin, yeah. do you even in India? You know, we of course there are a lot of alternative medicine uh, uh, cures are being touted as cure for asthma. Is there some? Is there a magical cure for asthma? <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> so, asthma is one of these um, is a chronic health condition um, that, although in some people it comes and goes, mostly um, once it once it's there, at least in adulthood, it's it's there to stay. So it's a chronic disease, um, and we don't actually have a cure for it uh, yet. The Management of asthma is very much about uh, controlling the condition um, with effective uh, treatment, having in place safety nets for when things start to flare up. What about the place of alternative medicine? Well, I guess um, it's it's a difficult area because there are there are many uh, people out there who do very strongly believe in uh, alternative medicines and of course it's a very wide uh, it, there's a there's a lot under that umbrella and um, there are certain things that are probably beneficial such as uh, let's put perhaps uh, yoga and breathing exercises perhaps under yeah. alternative medicine and there um, there's there is some evidence, and um, perhaps there's a scientific logic behind those interventions as well. Um, but when it comes to swallowing pills, if you like, um, 
what I think is safe practice is to um, swallow pills or in, or in the case of asthma, inhaling treatments where there's a very, very strong evidence base behind uh, those actions. Um, and for, for the purposes of asthma, the, we have the treat, very, very effective treatments that can um, nicely control asthma for the great majority of people. Um, and so I think I would steer people in the direction of get those basic uh, building blocks uh, in place first um, before starting to look at maybe um, some of these alternative approaches. Okay, thank you. So yoga is one thing which can be tried, uh, at least for general health and general well-being also, yoga yeah. is taking to be a good alternative medicine. Maybe not strictly alternative medicine, but uh, just a way of life. That is what a lot of people say yoga is about. Uh, we have a question from uh, Fatima, a journalist from Dhaka, who says like, that like in TB, uh, Bangladesh can access quality assured medicines through TB drug facility. Why cannot we have a mechanism to support countries with quality assured medicines for asthma for all those in need? I couldn't agree more, um, and maybe this is something to, uh, to grasp and advocate for. The International Union Against TB and Lung Disease has done a lot of work in this area, and there was um, a development called uh, the Asthma Drug Facility, which tried to um, come up with such a solution for, for asthma. Um, I think the the bottom line is um, there needs to be political commitment, there needs to be investment, and there needs to be the health systems created, improved, uh, invested in uh, to make uh, these treatments available to people who need them, and also to make sure that they're used wisely. Um, so I, I, I couldn't agree more that there absolutely should be um, a system available to everyone around the world in a similar way to how uh, the TB uh, health and uh, com community um, has, has seen access to quality assured TB medicines. Okay, so we need to look into that. Means I think that's really a call for the day. Uh, we have a question from Kathleen Pretoria. Who wants to know if drug resistance is a challenge in asthma care too? As drug resistance is a huge challenge in uh, tuberculosis, malaria, HIV in some countries. Is it a challenge in asthma care also? Uh, that's a great question actually. Um, so the reason why drug resistance is a big issue for the conditions that you've just mentioned is mainly because those are infectious uh, diseases. Um, and so the battle against those diseases is against uh, an organism that's constantly trying to evolve its way around our medicines and then in so doing uh, develops drug resistance. In some ways we're, we're, we're lucky in the asthma world in that um, there is a, um, the main problem with asthma isn't a battle against an infectious organism but actually it's in um, to some extent it's a battle against ourselves um, or it's a battle against um, allergens in the environment. So the underlying problem in asthma is um, predominantly one of inflammation within the airways, um, an unhelpful kind of inflammation. But luckily uh, there isn't an organism underlying that that's trying to evolve resistance to our drugs. So largely drug resistance um, in the way we look at it, at least in terms of infectious diseases, is not a problem. But what there is, is a group of patients, and it's probably about 10% of patients, who despite access to all, um, all treatments money can buy, uh, find that their asthma doesn't respond uh, fully um, and they, that despite all of the best treatments still have uncontrolled 
asthma. And so, in a way, you could say that those patients' asthma is resistant uh, to drugs to some extent. Mm -hmm. uh Kevin, as I had mentioned earlier, we all know that doc, Dr. Mark Weinberg, he sadly passed away due to possibly an asthma attack while swimming. Uh, can you please help us understand how people with asthma should care of their asthma and swim safely and maybe do other uh, activities without fear and exercise caution where, wherever it is due? Yes, well, I think firstly, exercise is a really important part of uh, staying generally fit and well and it's a very very useful uh, uh, activity for respiratory health broadly and for asthma um, so um, as a broad concept exercise is to be encouraged in people with with asthma um, there are um, things that can be done uh, to try to minimize the effects of uh, exercise on, on asthma and that there certainly is a group of patients who are very sensitive to um, exercise and will get symptoms of asthma um, and their airways will tighten up in response to exercise that's known as exercise induced asthma or exercise induced bronchospasm and I think two things are, are perhaps important uh, one is to make sure that the basic maintenance treatment that's needed to control the underlying airway inflammation is in place, is taken uh, regularly, is used, taken correctly. Um, uh, because any of these triggers, exercise for example, um, uh, the effects of those can be minimized by um, appropriate basic uh, um, uh, preventer treatment. Um, and then something that uh, can, can help avoid asthma symptoms during exercise is to uh, pre-medicate. So that, that would involve taking um, the reliever inhaler just before taking exercise uh, to prevent uh, bronchospasm. Um, and the other thing is, of course, to have available the reliever inhalers should asthma symptoms start to occur during exercise. Uh, you uh, spoke about 10% patients, uh, Kevin, who do not respond to treatment. Is it because uh, their asthma is due to some uh, genetic uh, factor or uh, what could be the reason for that? Then... So the short and easy answer is perhaps we don't really know. Um, the, um, a slightly longer answer would be yes, uh, that um, genetic factors no doubt uh, play a part. Um, one, of the, one of the difficulties with, with uh, asthma is that our, um, our understanding of you know, why do some people get it and other people don't get it and what are the factors that uh, contribute to its development uh, um, and progression. Um, and the risk of exacerbations is often quite poorly um, understood and that's especially so for this group of people um, who are the, the tip of the iceberg who really um, are difficult to uh, uh, con control despite access to um, all available treatments. Um, and so it may be something to do with their particular type of asthma. Um, so although we talk about asthma as being a single entity, the reality is that there are lots of, there's a lot of detail uh, underneath the surface um, and lots of different subtypes of asthma. And so one, one of the problems in this 10% may be that there's a, there's a type of asthma that simply isn't being hit by these uh, other drugs. Um, but in, the, in people with more difficult to control asthma, sometimes there are other things at play too. Um, things that are not actually to do with, with asthma, um, such as um, lack of fitness, um, obesity, exposure to uh, tobacco smoke, um, and, uh, um, and psychological problems um, as well. And sometimes other coexisting health problems that 
have been thought to be asthma, but in fact are not asthma, such as heart problems, for example. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, Saranjali uh, from India wants to ask you that you mentioned biomass cooking stoves. You have done a lot of research in that area, Kevin. Can yeah. you, she wants you to elaborate a bit more in context of asthma and also in context of general lung health. So, um, when it comes to the problem of biomass smoke exposure, um, this, is, um, this is a particularly poor evidence area. Um, astonishing, really, that for an exposure that does affect almost half the world's population, and in fact, um, household air pollution uh, is, is thought to be responsible for some four million deaths around the world every year. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about something that kills many, many more people than, H um, than uh, uh, tuberculosis and malaria put together. Um, yet there's very, very little uh, data out there. I put this down largely to this being a problem of the world's poor and therefore, um, you know, po poverty uh, in its broader sense um, also means that people living in um, poor conditions are get, are somewhat neglected by the medical research uh, community. Um, so actually the evidence that we're working on is very ropey. Um, we, um, we did a, a trial that was published in the Lancet um, not that long ago, um, which was uh, conducted in Malawi um, and tested out uh, cleaner burning cook stoves um, we gave households in 150 uh, villages in Malawi either two cleaner burning cook stoves and a solar charger to charge up the battery inside them, um, or they continued to cook over their open fires. Um, and in this study, we were looking particularly at whether uh, children uh, in those households would have a lower risk of pneumonia, so a serious lung infection in the cook stove group compared to the open fire group. Um, we found actually no difference uh, in pneumonia rates between the cook stove group and the open fire group, um, which was in some ways a surprising finding. Um, but um, alongside the study, we found that households in, so the, in these rural, rural households, um, many people were exposed to lots of other sources of smoke beyond cooking um, on a day-to-day -day basis, including the burning of rubbish, including um, tobacco smoke exposure, including industrial uh, level uh, cooking, which quite possibly overcame, overwhelmed any potential benefit of the cook stoves. Um, so we, one of the conclusions to draw from uh, that study uh, is perhaps that tackling any one individual issue in, a, in its isolation is most, is, um, well, sometimes may be effective in this context of trying to deal with a, an issue that affects air pollution and exposure to uh, smoke um, is unlikely to be effective. Um, and that what is going to be needed, um, and again, this is something of uh, global relevance, is effective strategies for cleaning up the air that we breathe. Yes, rightly so. I request the participants to please send your questions. We have just one more minute left. So you can use the chat function or raise your virtual hand on the webinar screen. Uh, meanwhile, we have a question from a journalist from India, Rahul, who wants to know if there is a link between asthma and sleep apnea. Great question. Um, I think the answer is probably um, sleep. Um, I guess in, in brief, sleep apnea is often a problem that affects people who are somewhat overweight or obese. Um, and we know that people who are somewhat overweight and obese are also at an increased risk of asthma and asthma related symptoms. So there is an association um, 
it may well be largely explained by uh, weight per se in the great majority of, of, of patients and that for both asthma and obstructive sleep apnea in those people who are overweight and obese um, reducing their weight into a more normal range would be beneficial. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. We, uh, we can, uh, I think Dr. Surikant is there, so we can yes. ask, we can ask him to speak for maybe three, four minutes. We have already uh, overshot the time for the webinar. So if you could just sum up very briefly your comments on asthma, Dr. Surikant. Okay, sorry Shobhaji, due to technical problem, I could not connect. Yes, so please just within four or uh, five minutes if you could sum okay, up. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, should I show some uh, PowerPoint slides? Whatever you want, but just keep the time in mind or you can speak or sure, show slides. Sure, sure. sure, sure, you connect. Okay, so uh, we are celebrating uh, in future on 2nd May, the World Asthma Day. And this is our professional duty and moral duty to make people aware about the asthma. So asthma is basically a genetic disorder. In, uh, for media or for public, I can say it's a basically genetic disorder. And if you see the lung, lung is a beautiful organ and basically a disease of lung. And uh, if you see the burden of the disease, it's a very highly burdened disease, around 300 billion people affected globally. And India is also having 10% share, that is 30 million. Now, this is the concept slide of bronchial asthma. There is a genotype and there is an environmental interaction. And due to this interaction between the environmental factors with the genotype of the patient, the result is asthma. And that's why most of the time we are getting a family history. I'll give you a very good example for what's happening in asthma. If you touch any leaf of any plant, nothing will happen. But if you see on my PowerPoint, this is touch me not plant. And if you just touch these leaves, they will shrink. And that's the condition of bronchial asthma patient. That is their bronchial tubes or you can say the airways, they are very much hypersensitive. And whenever they come into contact with the allergen factors, they get a spasm. And that's why patient feel dyspneic. If you see the very risk factor for asthma, of course, Genetic risk factors are on the top, but the age, gender, allergic condition, family history are also the important factors. The modifiable factors are very important, which we can modify. And in India and developing countries, the tobacco, smoke, and biomass fuel, and occupational exposure, three are the three very important risk factors for the precipitation of asthma. There are certain other uh, important things like preterm birth, baby, and cesarean delivery. Very important factor coming up. The normal delivery is not so a risk factor for asthma, but cesarean delivery. So those who are delivering with the cesarean delivery, they are at high risk for developing asthma. And this is, I used to say like ABC of asthma. A stands for air hyperresponsiveness or hypersensitivity. B stands for bronchoconstriction and C stands for chronic inflammation. And diagnosis is usually is still in 2017 is totally dependent upon correct history. And for this history, we take some certain symptoms. We know this episodic breathlessness, cough, wheeze, and chest tightness, usually symptom. This is the one story of trigger factors in India, very important uh, survey which has been conducted. And to my utter surprise, the 30% of patients, they are hypersensitive or trigger, trigger factors are the ice drink, means cold drinks and ice cream. All drinks having ice in it or they are refrigerated they are the very important trigger factor in India. This factor is coming up very big way in our country. I think this, you see, usually people, they are not aware of diagnosis as well. And usually they have just have the history. But like uh, we take the temperature by thermometer, we take BP by BP machine. So we have to use the asthma monitor also by a lung function test. And lung function test can be spirometry or peak flow by diameter. Then every glittering is not asthma. Every wheezing is not asthma. So we have to keep in mind that there are certain other conditions which may mimic the symptoms of asthma. And these are the important thing is the cigarette induced, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, tropical pulmonary heart failure, pulmonary tuberculosis, pulmonary embolism, 
laryngeal dysfunction, interstitial lung disease, and bronchitis. So there are some conditions which actually mimic the asthma. I'm showing the photograph of the three patient here, and here you can see the first patient is of asthma, while the second and third patient they are of COPD. So usually the chest appearance or physical appearance in case of asthma is usually normal in contrast to COPD. And I used to teach my students, my doctors, my Indian Medical Association friends and other fraternity that if you really want to approach, there is a 6D approach. This is my personalized view of approaching the asthma that first you have to become the asthma doctor. This is called first D. Second, you should be competent enough to make the diagnosis and differential diagnosis. Third, you should know the skill, how to select the drugs and their doses. And fourth thing is very important, how to select the device, because devices may be the dry powder inhaler or the multi-dose inhaler. How to select it, it's art. And this you have to learn. And of course, the deliberation, that is patient interaction, patient communication is a very important thing for asthma. And last but not the least, the 60, that is adherence. So adherence to therapy, it's a lifelong disease, but lifelong control. So adherence to inhalation therapy as advised by your doctor is very important. Thank you very much, uh, Shobhaji, for yes. giving me this uh, wonderful opportunity. Thank you. That was Professor Surikant, head of the Department of Respiratory Medicine at India's prestigious King George's Medical University, KGMU. He is also the current national president of Indian Chess Society. And we congratulate you for the award you received yesterday, Dr. Surikant. <laughs> Thank you. You are very much updated. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, we would like uh, you to tell the audience what award you received. And then there is one question for you. Is asthma okay. on the rise in India? Okay. This award basically was from Times of India Group. That is the Health Icon Award. And this was uh, given, by, uh, given to me by Health Minister of Uttar Pradesh. So now coming to your question, that is, what are the regions why asthma is gearing up in India? I think there are three, four very important regions I would like to discuss. The first is the children population. The childhood asthma is increasing in India by anything. It's a huge number. It's a huge increase in last one decade. And the simple reason is because of the changing habits of Indian children. Now, Indian children, they are more taking the fast food, cold drink, ice cream, junk food, tin food, and that's the single important region in this country that why childhood asthma is increasing, number one. Number two, the vehicular pollution is also increasing in this country. Smoking is also increasing. And it's still the biomass fuel is still a problem. Uh, thanks to our Prime Minister, PM Modi ji, who has given a very good important uh, scheme for a poor, that it give it up and Ujjala Yojana. And now not a poor, poor people, they are replacing their traditional biomass fuel kitchen into the LPG gases. So thanks to our Prime Minister that now probably asthma and COPD will decrease by after one, day, one decade. The next problem is the different occupations in India and I, will, I can say in developing countries, different developing countries also, that lot of occupations they are involved, a lot of smoke and dust and that's why people working in these occupations, they are also exposed for development of asthma and other lung disorders. So these are the three, four regions. The one is the changing dietary habit that is changing uh, for dietary habits from simple, simple Indian uh, diet to the fast food. Second is the smoking and the vehicular pollution. And of course, third, the biomass fuel is still. And fourth is the different occupations. These are the main culprit as far as the increase in asthma concerned in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to our esteemed panelists and participants for being us with us today on this special webinar in the lead up to World Asthma Day 2017. Special thanks to Kevin for a very wonderful and interesting interactive session with you. Thanks to Professor Surikant for making it to the webinar despite all his preoccupations. And again, not but last but not the least, to Chakatip for sharing her personal experience of dealing with this disease. Have a good day and as always, the recording of the webinar will be made available soon to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Shubhaji. Thank you. Thank you.